Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Nowinski. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. And welcome to our first webinar, Managing Post-Concussion Syndrome in the Time of Coronavirus. We are really happy and honored to have you here. Uh, welcome you into our, my home, our team's homes, while you guys are unfortunately probably stuck in your home. You know, as somebody who struggles with the symptoms related to post-concussion syndrome, which I'll call PCS throughout this, from an injury uh, nearly 17 years ago for me, I know that the recent changes to how we live and work and our access to doctors and rehabilitation, therapy, our stress and anxiety levels, our thoughts about our family, our country, all the disruptions to our life that have been maintaining symptoms, exercise, the ability to get out, uh, it's tough. This is a tough time. And so we wanted to put this together for you. You know, that if you're feeling a little worse today than you were a month ago, you're not alone. And in fact, you know, with the, with the 600 people that signed up for this, um, you're a big group that are all dealing with this. So I want to say this, this, this webinar is actually sponsored by our partners at the Concussion Legacy Foundation Canada. It's our first international partner led by Tim Fleischer, who's actually my former college teammate. It goes back a long time. I want to give a special thank you to the Ontario Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, Culture, and Minister Lisa McLeod, as well to Len Asper and Anthem Sports Entertainment for generally not only supporting this, but all educational events in Canada. So welcome to all our friends in Canada. Welcome to all our friends around the world and in Europe and across America uh, as we all sort of face this, uh, this journey together. I'm going to start with a quick outline of what's to come and I'll shortly be joined by two PCS veterans who will share with you how they are dealing with this new world. And then we'll be joined by my co-founder, Dr. Robert Cantu, the doctor who really helped me through my concussions. So I hope he can help you the same way he helped me with his wisdom and experience. And we'll have a Q&A after Dr. Cantu, so feel free to put in questions anytime. There's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll end the session with some special uh, meditation session led by Dr. Shannon Alberelli. And she'll help us get all into the right headspace leading into the weekend. So this webinar is focused on patients and caregivers of those fighting PCS, which Dr. Cantu will speak to uh, in a bigger way, but it's generally defined as concussion symptoms lasting a month or more. This will last about an hour, uh, but if this screen time sparks symptoms, rest assured we're recording it and we will post it. We'll email it to everyone on the list. So step away if you need a break, need a breath. Uh, we don't want to make things worse for you. You can rejoin the meditation session probably uh, around 440. So to open, I want to lead you through our resources available to you all the time, 24-7 on our website and social media channels. So at this point, I am going to share my screen. which I believe I just did successfully. And I just want to show you uh, things that you can find. So if you don't get the answers you need today, these are always sit sitting there waiting for you. Our website's broken down into the resources based on what's bringing it to us. So we have a PCS resources right here. We're on our website here. You will find a lot of videos of Dr. Cantu telling us everything we need to know about PCS a section on post-concussion syndrome treatments. And right now it's focused on evidence-based treatments, although we'll be expanding it to um, other treatments, uh, experimental treatments. If some of you have ideas you want to send us, please let us know. The section I want to focus on now, though, is coping with PCS. Because coping with PCS is really what we're all dealing with today. How do you live day to day when you might be stuck in a small space, uh, might not have the same uh, freedom and routines and who knows. So on coping with PCS, we have a whole lot of information. Before we I just quickly walk you through it, I do want to point out we do have a post-concussion syndrome newsletter. So every month we send around information on new research, new ideas, new strategies, new videos, new resources. So please do reach out there. Um, but just to give you the 30-second the version, it starts with trust yourself, post-concussion syndrome is real. I know people tell you they don't believe it. Sometimes your work or your school or someone's not helping you out the way you wish they would. I struggled with it because uh, before I got hurt, I didn't necessarily buy into it either. Sometimes, unfortunately, you got to go through it to realize how legitimate it is. 
And our advice is, when, you know, when you know you have it, when you get diagnosed by a clinician with it, settle in for the long haul. It's, it's not going to change overnight, but it will get better. And that getting better comes from doing the work to get better. Sometimes part of it is time, but part of it is rehabilitation, part of it's commitment, part of it's getting to understand why you're still having symptoms uh, and, and controlling them so you can live the best life you can. A special message to parents, if it's your child suffering from PTS, be their advocate. And we have a whole section on how to do that. Uh, and we highlight some parents who've done a great job, um, like Noah's folks here. And then the, just the, the, a part that you can actually help us continue to build is finding strategies that manage your symptoms. So we've had a bunch of wonderful PCS sufferers like Allie uh, give their tips. She always created a concussion kit and took it with her everywhere she went, whether she needed sunglasses or whether she needed earplugs or whatever it was to manage her symptoms. Quentin had an escape plan. He was ready to walk out of any situation he was in when it became too disruptive. Scott focused on being a nap ninja. Tyler, I do got to talk to you about getting rid of this picture, though. I don't know what was going on with my hair in this year. Uh, Georgia uh, knows what to expect, so she's all, she actually started chronicling her symptoms to understand what the triggers were and what was happening before and after. So there's a lot of ways that you can uh, manage and learn how to cope with your symptoms. Esther Lovett, one of our rock stars, has a great blog about what she's dealt with. She had a concussion that took away her soccer career. She had to change schools. She's now doing great at Georgetown. She can talk to you about everything that she's done. So just know this is all here for you to learn. And then I wanna add a special plug for, we last year we started our CLF helpline. We haven't been promoting it heavily as we're getting, getting used to uh, learning how to deal with it. But if you have a specific problem, if you're not getting the, the help you need, you, if you don't have the right doctor, you don't have the right perspective, you need something specific, please do reach out. Um, submit your request, we'll get back to you within three working days. Really the goal is to give referrals to uh, clinicians and centers that we know do a good job on this or we believe do a good job on this. We often connect people with mentors, so if you feel like you wanna to talk to somebody who's been through this to help give you that hope, that one-on-one -on -one reminder that you're gonna get better, please do. Uh, please, please reach out, we'll find you a mentor if you wanna be a mentor. You're welcome to as well. Uh, Tyler will put an, uh, an email address at the bottom if you want to talk mentorship in the chat space. Um, but wanted to focus on the helpline. And then to, to wrap it up, social media. So um, please feel free to follow us on Facebook, Concussion Legacy Foundation, Instagram. The team's been doing a great job, and especially with one specific thing. Every Monday we post videos about concussion hope. We invite videos from it, and it could be from you, uh, on how you deal with PCS, what you're thinking about, and always talking about living with hope because we know what it's like to have those dark days. And we wanna always be there to remind you it will get better, it will get better. And so uh, feel free to sign up to see those videos and we look forward to you contributing them one of these days. Now, one of the things, um, all right, now I think I'm done sharing the screen. So thank you guys for bearing with me on that. Now I wanna talk about um, our guests. So one of the things we always hear about is that it's important to feel validated when you have PCS. When you sometimes get the diagnosis, you're the only person you know, you think you're alone, you think you're the first person. Part of putting together this webinar is to show you that you're not alone in your struggle. Um, and so we were really honored to invite two members of our PCS community that we've known now for a long time. Gracie Hussey and James Shorn. They've both endured years long battles with PCS. They've both overcome, uh, you know, got to know Gracie during her, her really tough days, and now she's doing great in college. And they want to share their experience, provide some wisdom, and provide that hope um, that things will get better and talk about how they're dealing with the current time. So, first, I want to invite Gracie in. So, Gracie, welcome. Uh, joining us today from back in her home in Memphis, Tennessee. Can we see Gracie yet? Oh, yep, you just gotta, I see you're still on mute. I think Tyler's switching it all in the back end as we figure this out. Can you hear me? Hey, we can hear hey. you. Hey. Welcome. Thank you. 
Uh, Grace is a sophomore at University of Alabama. She's now back home in Memphis taking virtual classes like so many of you who are in college. Um, Gracie, it's, thanks for joining us. Do you want to start by walking us through how you got post-concussion syndrome? Yes. So the concussion that led me to believe that I got post-concussion syndrome from happened to me in seventh grade. I was in a soccer game for my school team, and there was about two minutes left, and a girl was really frustrated that her team was losing, so she took it out on me. The ball was actually at the other end of the field, and she just two-hand shoved me. And I fell back and hit my head so hard on the turf that it bounced up and I hit it again. So I had a really bad concussion and whiplash on top of that. And I was home from school for about three weeks, but I got really frustrated with not being able to do anything because I'm used to being very active. So I kind of lied about my symptoms and said they got better and they worsened for the next couple years. And finally, in 10th grade, about three years later, they got so bad that I had to be homeschooled for a semester and try to get back on track and did a bunch of therapies and stuff like that. So that's kind of where it got to the worst part. But then after being homeschooled for a little bit, it got better, but I still struggled with my symptoms, but I was at least able to get back to school. Yeah, and what would you say were the, were the things that helped you start to overcome those symptoms and get back to school? The things that helped me the most were acupuncture, and I went to a chiropractor that really helped just realign my neck because that was causing a lot of my headaches. And the symptoms I struggled most with were headaches, nausea, light sensitivity, and smell sensitivity. So not being at school really helped with that just because I could monitor the lights and noises and smells on my own. And I also did exercise. Exercise was really hard for me during my really bad days, but it was the only thing that actually helped my headaches at first exercising made my headaches worse, which I know that probably happens to a bunch of y'all. So I got really discouraged and stopped working out. But then I realized I got in a worse cycle of just laying there and like feeling my pain. But I actually went outside and started going on walks and that really helped me too. Yeah. And you know, you did a great job fighting through it all. So now we're in this uh, new space where school gets canceled. You have to go back home. Um, does it remind you a little bit of those times? I was about to say when I first, I was on spring break actually, when I first got the email from the University of Alabama saying that we wouldn't be returning to campus. And I immediately thought, oh my goodness, this is going right back to my 10th grade years when I was homeschooled, isolated from all my friends. And at first I was really discouraged and scared that I would go back into that kind of slump that I was dealing with and that maybe my symptoms would come back just because I wasn't being around people, like getting my mind off my symptoms or just my everyday routine of working out and doing things to prevent my symptoms. So when I moved home, I tried to get on the front hand of that so I would prevent it, but it definitely felt a lot like I was back to my concussion days, just isolated from everyone in my own house. Yeah, and, and so have any symptoms come back, gotten worse while you've been home and, and how are you coping with that? So my symptoms that have gotten worse since I've been home are my headaches and light sensitivity just because everything's online now and I'm not used to doing my schoolwork as frequently online because I go in class in person and do the things I have to do. But now I'm listening to my teachers online and everything. So that's really worsened my light sensitivity. So what I've been doing to prevent that is doing schoolwork for an hour and then taking a 30 minute break, whether it's resting my eyes, taking a little nap, or walking around my neighborhood just to get some fresh air and help with my head getting so tired in my eyes. But those have definitely come back, I've noticed. Yeah. And, and how, how are you keeping a positive attitude through all this? Honestly, my main thing is that I've been through this before and I've gotten through it. So I know that this isn't gonna, going to be any different than my times beforehand. And so I've just tried to keep that in my, the back of my head that every single time I've had to do this kind of like self isolation thing for my headaches I've come out more positive each time and so I've definitely thought about that and then just staying active and trying to keep my routine as normal as possible even though I'm not really allowed to go anywhere but just walking around my neighborhood and working out has honestly been my savior because I haven't gotten into the cycle of just laying in a dark room because my head hurts but I've stayed on top of things and kept working out and that's honestly what's helped me stay most positive. Oh wow. Well. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story and, and for staying positive and continuing to be a force of hope out there. 
Yes. All right, say hi to your folks for me. I will, thank you. All right, thank you, Gracie. All right, next we have James Shorn uh, joining us here from Miami, where he is also sheltering in place. He's set to graduate in May from the University of Miami Law School. So I think part of this uh, also inviting these two fine folks is to show that, you know, post-concussion doesn't have to end your academic career. Uh, you know, you just got to fight through it. So uh, James, welcome. Would you please start by sharing with us, uh, you know, how and when you first developed your post-concussion syndrome? Sure. Um, so I played uh, lacrosse in high school, and most of my concussions were from that. I had five recorded concussions, but, um, you know, in hindsight, it's probably closer to nine or ten. So um, I had one really bad one in my junior year of high school in 2011. Uh, sort of a similar narrative to Gracie. I took about three weeks off. You know, I was completely out of commission with reading or understanding any math or anything like that and headaches and all that stuff. Um, so I tried going back to school. I was sort of facing pressures to keep playing sports and things like that. Um, so I went back to school, went back to playing lacrosse and suffered another one while I was already still, you know, having these symptoms. Um, and that really put me out of commission. So I ended up taking a year off high school um, and then during that time, I was just doing a lot of therapies, you know, seeing a lot of doctors, trying everything I could and sort of seeing what stuck. Um, and eventually I was able to graduate high school and on to University of Miami for undergrad and now law school. Oh, that's great. And then are you still, what are you still dealing with today before this all went down? Yeah, sure. So... Some of my big ones still are migraines, still usually, you know, a daily, every other day migraine. Um, some of the cognitive stuff is, is what it is, but you sort of learn how to cope with it. You know, my memory might not be what it used to be, but those are things you learn how to work around and um, sort of learn different ways to make it work through school. Um, some mental health things, have still been really bad, you know, anxiety and depression. So getting help with those, practicing meditation, things like that, uh, those have really helped. So those are the big ones that still have stuck around. Um, yeah, well, that's a lot to deal with. But I mean, it's, I'm so glad to hear you're still having this great success, all things considered, right? right? Yeah. yeah. And what has it gotten anything, anything gotten worse since you've been sort of stuck at home? That's a good question. You know, I think it's hard for me, you know, I really thrive off a routine with all this. So it's hard to sort of get that um, taken away from you. So I'm trying to stay in my routine. Um, I've sort of taken it as an opportunity to do a lot of the things that I know help mitigate my symptoms um, now that I have the time for them. So things like I'm trying to be much better about meditation. I'm trying to be much better about exercising and eating right and doing all the things that help me feel better. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it's been hard, you know, obviously everyone's experiencing some sort of anxiety about the state of the world right now. Um, but I'm just trying to stay on a routine. And now that I have the time, really uh, take time to do the things that have helped me the most. You know, I appreciate your really positive attitude. You know, what do you, what is helping you keep that hope? What do you, and what's your message to everyone out there struggling? So when you guys first approached me, um, I sort of started to think about things I wish I had known when I was first going through this and sort of, I sort of made a list. Uh, the first one is just being patient and forgiving yourself. You know, recovery is not a straight line at all. You're going to have good days and bad days. And it is what it is, you know, uh, it's okay to not be okay. You need to just allow yourself that and give yourself time. Don't get frustrated. Um, Cause what you have is very real. You know, there are times when I was first going through it when I would even convince myself that it wasn't a thing what I was going through, you know, it wasn't a real medical condition, things like that. You sort of touched on this in the introduction. Um, another big one is reaching out. You know, I felt like I couldn't talk to anyone about what was happening to me for a whole host of reasons. You know, I was embarrassed, shy. I felt like people didn't understand. Um, and I know it feels like no one understands what you're going through and most people probably won't be able to understand, but that doesn't mean they don't want to help, you know. 
um, so many people want to help and they're willing to be there for you and they might not know how to right away and they might not understand but they're certainly willing to try I found the more I reach out so um, one of the best things I ever did to my for myself was uh, talk to people that weren't going through this but still willing to be there for me so finally opening up opening up and reaching out was a huge one um, another big one for me that my parents sort of instilled in me after I started going back to school, particularly college, was to just ask for things. Um, you know, I obviously struggled and needed some help through school because of all my symptoms. Um, and I was really embarrassed to sort of use it as an excuse. You know, I was really hesitant to. Um, but I found that my parents always say, just ask. And the worst thing that would happen is they say no and you're in the same situation. But I found if you're just upfront and candid and honest with people, um, most people respond to that really well and are happy to help out. That was, that's amazing. That's really good advice. We're gonna have to turn that into a one pager in its own video. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, James, so much for joining us and sharing your wisdom and your experience. Uh, yeah, that's uh, powerful stuff. Thank you, happy to be here. All right, thank you. And so I want to thank James and Gracie, not only for being here and for sharing what they're going through, but also uh, they've also done something really special for us, which is they both put together Facebook fundraisers recently for us. Um, Gracie is a former soccer player, started one recently to support the Shine study. So if you don't familiar with it, uh, the Concussion Legacy Foundation recently committed $100,000 to Boston University, who's leading a study uh, of 20 former professional women's soccer players to try to better understand the long-term effects of repeated brain trauma in soccer and in women's sports because there has never been a study like this. So Michelle Akers and Brandy Chastain are actually recruiting 18 members of the women's national team uh, from the good old days in the 90s. And um, we're excited about that. And Gracie's helped us, We've already raised uh, over $1,700 for that study. So thank you, Gracie. And James, had an amazing success story. And he was the one who sort of taught us the power of Facebook fundraisers because he, he decided to do one. Uh, started with a $400 goal and his friends and community ended up raising over $12,000. So James, thank you for making that happen for us so that we can deliver these uh, programs. So this foundation, this event is, is, is free it's for your sport, CLF Canada. Uh, but I, I'm told at this time, I'm never really comfortable. I know we're all struggling right now with not knowing what the future is going to be, but I'm told we have to keep bringing this up. So if you do feel this is helpful to you and you want to pay it forward so we can continue to do these programs, feel free to, to donate. $20 helps us, for example, make sure we can get back to the next helpline inquiry and give them that personal support. So Tyler put a link into the, the chat area uh, if you're interested. If this isn't the right time for you, which I'm sure is the case for many, we do recommend those Facebook fundraisers are powerful. And for us, 90% of the people who do them actually reach their goals. So if it's uh, raising from your community is super powerful for us to keep this work going. So there's the plug uh, that I'm told I have to give. So now, now we've gotten through our patient portion. Um, and now we're really delighted to be joined by the man, the myth, the legend, people call him the godfather of concussion research. Uh, my co-founder with the Concussion Legacy Foundation uh, and our medical director, Dr. Robert Cantu. Dr. Cantu, welcome. And that is a powerful, it's a powerful bookshelf. You were muted there for your hello. Uh, now I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, cool, good. Great start. Yeah, good. Thanks for joining us. So, um, yeah, so please, I, we asked Dr. Cantu to walk us through a little bit about more of the medical side of post-concussion syndrome. So he's going to talk a little bit about, you know, we're worried about you might have been cut off from your treatment center or, or maybe haven't found the right one. And so Dr. Cantu is going to talk about what we're, what we're doing these days for treatment for PCS and how you can adjust in the time of coronavirus. So all yours, Doc. Great, Chris. Uh, what I thought I'd do is take a few minutes to walk people through what we would normally be doing now if we were up and running as opposed to uh, virtually uh, still in existence and then focus on what we are doing right now and some special advantages, if you can think of it that way, that can be had by us being shuttered largely uh, in-house uh, today for post-concussion patients. So, Tyler, if you start with that first slide, 
the definition of post-concussion syndrome, although there are multiple international consensus definitions, the one that docs use are really individuals that have post-concussion symptoms which have gone on longer than one month. That's the one that almost all concussion specialists are using for the diagnosis of post-concussion syndrome. Next one, Tyler. We, most of us use a checklist for concussion symptoms. Uh, we've devised one that has broken it out into the different domains of cognitive symptoms. So in the next slide, you'll see that the various symptoms can be broken out into those that are cognitive symptoms, such as the issues with confusion and concentration and memory, and the things that are so uh, disorganizing to somebody trying to stay in school. There are physical symptoms, which are far and away the more common symptoms, the headache, the sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise, ringing in the ears. There are also vestibular ocular symptoms that include difficulties with balance, blurred vision, double vision, dizziness. There are sleep symptoms, usually right after a concussion. It's issues with sleeping more than usual, but as time goes on, certainly if there are weeks that go on with symptoms, the symptoms more commonly become now drowsy, fatigue, and trouble falling asleep. And then there are the emotional symptoms, which are so significant in almost everybody that's got post-concussion syndrome that goes on for an extended period of time, partly because of the injury itself and partly because of the fact that one's life has been totally disrupted in a terrible way. You've been taken away from what you wanted to do, what once was easy and rewarding is now no longer able to be done at all or can be done but is very difficult. As we move through the slide deck, Tyler, we see here that what is the best predictor of who's going to have a prolonged recovery from concussion, in addition to whether or not you had some pre-concussion uh, conditions, like if you came into a concussion with a history of migraine or a history of mood disorder or a learning disability, these are kind of red flags that go up that suggest that you may have a more protracted recovery than somebody that didn't have these conditions before their concussion. But far and away, the most important thing is how many symptoms you have and how severe they are. Uh, in our uh, checklist, we look at 26 possible symptoms and the higher number you get, uh, the more likely you're going to have a protracted course, especially if the symptoms are severe. As we see in the next uh, slide, the examination that the doctor is going to do on you for your concussion, in addition to going through the pre-morbid conditions you may have had before the con con concussion and going through the concussion symptoms that you have, He's going to carry out a neurological examination that's going to focus a lot on cognitive functioning. It's a very, very important part of it, but equally important should be eye tracking and eye function, especially your smooth eye movements as well as rapid eye movements called saccadic eye movements, and your ability to converge, which is like following your finger in toward your nose without it becoming looking like two fingers. Balance is another major area that's assessed and very commonly with uh, concussions, especially those where there's been a whiplash uh, injury, uh, neck pain and pain up the back of the head, cervicogenic uh, symptoms are very, very common. As we see in the next slide, the initial treatment for a concussion is rest and adjustments to work, to school, avoiding obviously going back to any sports until one is asymptomatic and especially trying to avoid any further head trauma, um, limiting one's time with screens. These are things which pretty much was the treatment of choice for concussions 10 years ago. But over the last five years especially, after an initial period of rest, next slide, 
we see that what we're really focused on are therapies. And these therapies were published a few years back by a group of us that met in Pittsburgh and had this conference. And the therapies, as you'll see in the next slide, focus on your constellation of symptoms. In other words, for the ocular symptoms, you're referred for ocular therapy, where saccadic eye movements, smooth pursuit, convergence testing, and training is carried out. For the vestibular symptoms or balance symptoms, it's a vestibular therapist. For the cervicogenic symptoms, it's cervicogenic physical therapy. And for the cognitive symptoms, it's referral for cognitive therapy, which is partly um, going through exercises, but mostly learning different ways of better retaining information, understanding how important it is, especially with post-concussion syndrome, that you have a quiet background, that you're not distracted while you're trying to concentrate. And also, most people find that they can learn a lot better by having not just visual learning, but auditory learning as well. So taping what you're trying to uh, learn, listening to audio tapes, uh, all are very helpful. In the next slide, we see that these different therapies are integrated because most people with post-concussion syndrome are not just going to have one symptom. They're not just going to have cognitive issues. Most people are going to have a combination. And so it involves um, often working with more than one therapist. And when the therapies are not in and of themselves um, as helpful as we would hope, the next step is pharmacy, and we see for cognitive issues, for emotional issues, next slide, for uh, depression and uh, anxiety issues, we have therapies uh, that are of the pharmacy nature that can be prescribed, but we use that as a last resort. Now that's kind of what happens in the center normally. And that's what would happen in most concussion centers, uh, we would hope, across the country. But these are very unusual times, obviously, with so many of us now sheltered uh, in place. But this need not necessarily make things worse. And it might actually uh, provide some opportunities uh, for improvement uh, that wouldn't have been there if we didn't have the chance to shelter in place. Right now, we're only able to do telehealth uh, calls uh, from our center, for instance. We can't have patients come in because all outpatient uh, patients have been kept out of the hospital as have bit visitors as well um, because of the concern about the contagiousness of this uh, COVID virus. Um, but individuals who are now sheltered at home um, for those that were trying to work and recover from their post-concussion syndrome at the same time, this gives them an opportunity to perhaps shut it down a little bit more than they might have been otherwise and recover more rapidly than they might have otherwise. Also, for individuals who are at home, most people, for instance, that have gone through vestibular therapy have been given a set of exercises, as is true of ocular therapy, to not only do while you're in therapy with your therapist, but to be, be carried out at home as well. And obviously this affords you the opportunity uh, to do that. Also for individuals where the emotional issues are keen, this is where the sheltering in place isn't necessarily perfect because the stress is there uh, Anybody obviously is concerned about whether they or their family, especially elder members of their family may contract this virus. Um, stress is not a good thing. Uh, it aggravates emotional symptoms, but it uh, clearly um, makes one think about the importance of what we're gonna close with today, which is meditation, but also things along that same line like mindfulness uh, and, and biofeedback. Uh, it's also true that there are two overriding 
nonspecific areas of therapy for post-concussion syndrome that probably don't get enough attention because unfortunately it's not been quite as well documented, although there is quite a bit of literature emerging about the efficacy of them. And I'm referring to diet and I'm referring to exercise. And let me start with diet, not just with individuals with cognitive issues, but primarily for that group. Um, diet may help your symptoms and the diet that certainly has gained the most acceptance in not just post-concussion syndrome, but in the dementia field has been the Mediterranean diet where we're getting away from processed foods. We're using uh, whole foods. We're using fruits and vegetables, um, olive oil, that kind of thing. Um, the other area is exercise. And when we're referring to exercise, we're always talking about exercise at a level that does not provoke your symptoms getting worse. But exercise is not only a stress reliever, it most, most people feel better after it, but it also has been shown to have um, protective and uh, corrective uh, capabilities as well as one's cognition as well both from the standpoint of neuroprotective uh, changes in the brain, as well as from the standpoint of allowing one that builds up lactic acid to secrete more growth hormone normally, uh, which can help one with cognitive and somatic symptoms, and especially those symptoms of feeling tired with lethargy slowed down. Um, so exercise is definitely something I would recommend for everyone. I think I heard Gracie indicate, uh, as is very true, that uh, if suddenly she's home and she's having to have more screen time than she would otherwise, uh, that can be a problem. But she's doing the absolute right thing in breaking up that screen time um, in segments before she starts to get more symptomatic and breaking it up with uh, periods of exercise is excellent. For screens in general, uh, if you haven't experimented before, most people find that an amber colored uh, piece of plastic over your computer screen will cause less eye strain, will cause less headache, will cause less exacerbation of symptoms than looking at a regular computer screen. And also the screen not as bright as it might otherwise be can be can be helpful as well. And conversely, when we're looking at uh, black and white pieces of paper um, with the black printing, most people find a blue uh, filter or a blue piece of uh, clear plastic over it will cause less eye strain and be helpful. Uh, that having been said, it's really something that needs to be experimented with, with uh, each individual because not everybody necessarily finds one versus the other color being more beneficial. These are just some general thoughts, Chris. Um, I think this is a very unique time. Um, the important thing is that just like from the standpoint of the virus itself, um, everybody will get through their post-concussion syndrome and they'll get through it best if they're working with therapies and they'll get through it best if they won't push their symptoms uh, to the level of, of uh, increasing them. Thanks, Bob. Uh, th thank you for that review and, and for that information. So we've got, we're getting some great questions put in. So we're gonna do a little five minute questions before we do the meditation. Um, and so one of, the, one of the interesting questions that was asked was, do we have any reason to believe that COVID-19 would be worse than somebody with a brain injury history? I think the answer is no, right? Well, we don't have clear-cut evidence, no, because the virus itself is not, thank God, is not primarily a cerebral virus. It's not primarily a brain virus. Okay, great. And then another great question from the group was, somebody said, I've had symptoms for more than 12 years, and, and now people are telling me that PCS doesn't last that long, and there's something else wrong with you. Obviously, I, as somebody who's been dealing with it for 17 years, I say, uh, I know I'm still different in, in three specific ways. What do you have to say about that? 
Well, I think unfortunately a very, very small percentage of individuals with PCS uh, will go on to have permanent symptoms. Almost all of them will be, uh, fortunately the symptoms will not be as severe as they once were early on for most people. Uh, but I would say that it is PCS in most of the cases with persistent symptoms, yes. Great. No, thank you. Um, I'm, I've, I've loved the chat going on. I see a lot of people mentioning online support groups are the things that we're going to we're going to start to build a list and send it out to folks. Uh, so feel free to send those along. Uh, somebody asked about concussion glasses. Is that helpful? Concussion glasses. Yeah. I, I'm not aware of concussion glasses per se. We do indeed use uh, colored glasses uh, for individual with light sensitivity. And so clearly um, using uh, early on, if the light sensitivity is quite severe, staying out of the bright sunlight is, is, is certainly the best thing. But when you do have to go outside wearing glasses uh, is with uh, uh, green tint is certainly uh, appropriate. As your sensitivity diminishes, we lighten the shades of the green and green is still the favored shade. Okay. Now, how about the difference between post-concussion syndrome and CTE? Because that's an important one. Because I, I know the, the headline is having PCS does not increase your risk of CTE. They're separate issues. Would you explain what that, what's going on there? Yeah, with post-concussion syndrome, the symptoms have occurred right after the concussion. And with CTE, most of the time, the symptoms will not occur shortly after you've had your uh, athletic career, but rather decades later. And so there'll be an interval of 10, 15, 20 years before you start to pick up symptoms. Now, once you pick up the symptoms, unfortunately, there's great overlap between the CTE symptoms and the post-concussion syndrome symptoms. So that can be confusing. But technically, with post-concussion syndrome, it's, it's a linear line from your concussion symptoms that didn't completely clear. Uh, most cases, they got better, and, and then in a few percentage, they won't completely clear. Thank you. All right, and how about, uh, somebody asked, ramping up their workouts with PCS, what's the guideline? The guideline is that you should be able to ramp up your workout if you can slowly, gradually do it without making the symptoms worse, either while you're doing it, immediately after it, or the next day. If the symptoms are worse while you're doing it, you should immediately stop. If they're worse later that night or the next day, you've done too much. You need to back down what you're doing. We want you to work at exercise, but under the radar of not provoking symptoms getting worse. Great. A couple more questions that popped in just for brevity because we've talked about this. I'll answer them. How do you get telemedicine appointments? That answer is it depends on your insurance, especially in the U.S. So uh, I had to look into this myself. So I would look into your insurance, but if you have telemedicine services, you have to request it through that and then probably find somebody who offers telemedicine services with concussions. So that's a little bit of a everyone's on their own path there. Uh, Somebody asked about neuroendocrine symptoms. So we just talked about this. You just wrote something we're about to add to our website. Do you want to quickly touch on uh, when you start thinking about neuroendocrine with PCS? Yes, the pituitary gland can be injured with uh, head trauma. It's not highly likely to happen, but it can happen and does happen. And the pituitary symptoms of hypothyroidism hypoadrenalism, hypotestosterism, low growth hormone can mimic the post-concussion symptoms of being cognitively fuzzy, being fatigued, being lethargic, being slowed down. So in individuals with protracted post-concussion syndrome symptoms, we always like to do a blood profile screening of pituitary studies, looking at thyroid, uh, cortisone for the adrenal gland, uh, ACTH as well, looking at growth hormone, looking at testosterone, prolactin, uh, to make sure that there isn't a pituitary abnormality. Because if there is, then it can be very quickly alleviated uh, by hormonal supplementation until the gland starts to work on its own normally again. 
All right, last two questions. You've touched on uh, vis or being overstimulated visually. What about you're very sensitive to sound? What's your recommendation on how to deal with sensitivity to sound day to day? Tough. Uh, some people have found that using earplugs are useful. Not earplugs that totally eliminate your ability to hear, but one that just cancels it somewhat. Um, it's pretty much like the um, same thing with the vision, and that is um, to the extent you're super sensitive, you want plugs that are going to be in a little tighter, and as you have less in the way of sensitivity to noise, uh, you, you, you back them out. All right, thank you. Um, sending a message. All right, and I, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna end with one last quick statement just to, so we can get to the meditation. I, somebody asked a question. It's always a great sort of uh, thing that makes you fired up. Uh, how do you educate people deal with my PC, you know, dealing with my PCS when they're accusing you of making it up or milking it? Uh, and they, because their expectations are wrong about what post-concussion uh, recovery can be. And you know, that's actually, that's why we exist. That's why the Concussion Legacy Foundation started. It was all around this weird, you know, headache that I had. I didn't find Dr. Cantor until three months in. And, and even then I didn't understand what I was dealing with. And still today people don't understand what it's dealing with. So I know it's frustrating. Uh, I know it's difficult. I used to say, you know, uh, you know if, if people are giving you a hard time about and telling you you're exaggerating, you know, send them to our website or, you know, send me a note and I'll call them and I'll, I'll yell at them and I'll tell them, for God's sake, <laughs> you're the problem here. It's not them. You, you, you injure your brain. You don't know which way it's going to go. You know, we got 86 billion neuron trillions of connections in there. You, you rattle that cage and things can change. The, the message here and the overall message of all this is it. We know it stinks. Everybody here appreciates it. We're with you. Brighter days are ahead. I feel 10 times better than I did 17 years ago. Still not 100%. You just, it's the riding out those plateaus, as James said. You're not better. It's not a consistent growth, but you get there. So we'll keep trying to educate and learn how you get better. People like Dr. Cantor are leading great research on this. You guys are educating us with your messages, but other resources are available. Sometimes just getting together is great. So uh, I want to thank everybody who has been, uh, Dr. Cantor, thank you so much for this. James, Gracie, everybody, thank you guys for being a part of this. And now we're going to shift over to the meditation. So thanks, Bob. You're welcome. Um, so I, we have our last speaker, and we're going to have a nice little uh, introduction to meditation and then a little set practice session. So um, Dr. Alberelli, I can see you have joined us. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Alberelli is a doctor of psychology. Uh, she's the founder of uh, Quell, a New Jersey's premier meditation and wellness center. Uh, we actually just met last month. Um, she's part of a very special group of people. She's part of our family advisory board at the foundation. And every couple of years we get, uh, we invite our family advisory board to meet at a conference we call our family huddle. There, being part of the family advisory board means that you've lost a loved one and you've donated their brain to our research in partnership with Boston University and the VA. And so Shannon unfortunately uh, lost her husband um, just a couple years ago and she donated his brain and uh, he was diagnosed with CTE. So, but at the conference, we, we got to know her and, and we learned about her extensive clinical experience and, and her expertise in meditation. And she actually led a meditation session for all of us. It was just fabulous. So we're super excited to have you back. Uh, Skype began from New Jersey where you got the two boys, I'm sure, hiding out somewhere behind you. I'm in my office, so they can't, they can't bother us. <laughs> oh, good. All right. Well, I will yield the floor to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really super excited to be here and do this for everyone. And I'm gonna kind of be quick because I wanna make sure that we actually get a practice of meditation. Um, so as Chris told you, my personal story is that um, my husband had CTE and it was a struggle for years before he even passed. And uh, one of the ways in which I tried to manage all of that and the emotions and the ups and downs was to meditate. And I can tell you my personal story is that it completely shifted my perspective on things and, and helped me calm down, kind of turn the volume down and be able to manage things in a more effective, um, effective way. And um, 
And then little did I know how much I would actually need meditation when he did pass. Um, it has been um, hard. And I will tell you, I wouldn't be able to even be here with you guys now if it weren't for meditation, because it's really been my anchor to get me through um, kind of difficult times. And we are living in a very difficult time right now. And while we can't control necessarily what's going on around us with the coronavirus, you can control what's going on within you and how you react to it. Um, and so, um, so meditation's important now more than ever that you can find a place of calm inside yourself. Um, for many of you, maybe you haven't meditated before. So I just want to tell you a few things about it and then we'll get into the practice. But um, so one of the common misconceptions with meditation is that you're supposed to stop your thoughts. And that's a completely impossible task to do. It's like telling your uh, eyes to stop seeing, you know, your mind is an organ, it's meant to think. So that's really not the goal of meditation. The, the goal of meditation is to be able to pull back and kind of be a curious observer of what's going on in your mind and to gently bring your attention back to whatever it is. We're going to do some breath meditation. So coming back to your breath and your mind is going to wander and you're just going to come back to your breath and don't try not to judge yourself. There's no right or wrong way to meditate. Uh, it's just a way for your, for your, your mind to kind of um, settle your body to settle, give yourself some stillness. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of um, downtime because we have our phones that follow us everywhere. And so we live in this modern world where, um, yeah, we, it's, it's easier than ever to be distracted from ourselves and meditation can help you um, calm down. And the cool, the cool thing about it right now is that um, there's so much research in the field showing that it actually really changes um, your brain and it, it, it has a positive impact um, on your brain structure. So, um, so I'm, I'm excited to be here and share this practice with you. Um, okay, so you wanna find yourself in a nice comfortable position and make sure that you have support, especially in your lower back. Um, and there's really no right or wrong position to meditate um, in. So uh, just get yourself comfortable. And if you need to move throughout the practice, that's fine. Um, if you hear noises, stuff's going on. Don't worry about it. Just allow that to, um, so just begin to bring your uh, hands down and you can either place your palms facing up or palms facing down and you can close your eyes or just simply gaze down in front of you. We're going to start with a long and slow deep breath. So breathe in all the way down to your belly and exhale. Just kind of let it out with an audible sigh. No one can hear you, so you can really let it go. Inhale and exhale. And just do this a couple more times, kind of going at your own pace, breathing in, breathing out. And then when you're ready, just come back to your natural breath. And we'll begin and end with the sound of the bell. And begin to pay attention to the sensation of your breath. Notice the cool air as it comes in through your nose. And the warm air as it comes out. Notice the simple fact that you are breathing. that it's your breath that sustains your life. And that in this moment, you are okay. Knowing that there's no other place to be and nothing else to do right now, but simply be here right now. And anytime your mind wanders, which it will, simply come back to your breath, breathing in, you're aware you're breathing in, and breathing out, you're aware you're breathing out.
and begin to feel a deep sense of relaxation. Travel from the top of your head, down your forehead, and soften your eyelids. And let your jaw drop down to its natural position. Breathing in, you're aware you're breathing in. And breathing out, you're aware you're breathing out. Allow your shoulders to rest heavy away from your ears, letting any tension simply melt away. Imagine your mind as this vast blue sky and any thought or feeling or emotion is simply like a passing cloud in this vast blue sky. And allow your arms to rest heavy at your sides. And then rest your attention gently at your heart center. And maybe you notice the beating of your own heart. And take a moment to honor your heart. Breathing in, you're aware you're breathing in. And breathing out, you're aware you're breathing out. And with your attention rested right at your heart, in your own mind, you can repeat these words. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we all be well. May we all be at peace and at ease. And may we all be happy. Begin to bring your attention down to your seat and notice where your body connects with the chair or the cushion underneath you. And begin to notice the support, whatever is underneath you. And the support of the earth underneath that knowing that you are always fully supported by the earth, gravity, and then allow a sense of relaxation now to travel down your legs. tops of your legs and the backs of your legs. All the way down to your feet and in and out of your toes. Taking a moment to be grateful for your feet. They carry you throughout the day.
And imagine your entire body enveloped in this bubble of relaxation. Notice what that feels like from the inside out. Breathe in a sense of love to every muscle and cell in your body. And breathe out a sense of peace. And breathing in love. And breathing out peace. And simply take the next minute to just rest in the stillness and the silence. Coming back to your breath if your mind wanders. And in a moment, I'll gently call your attention back to where you are. Just be very easy and gentle as you come out. And you can begin to wiggle your fingers and toes. And deepen your breath. And maybe just stretch out into the space around you. And I want to read you guys something um, before we wrap up that I, I thought was pretty inspiring considering what every, everyone's going through. Um, this is just a quote um, that Deepak Chopra actually posted. It said, and the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply, some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows. And the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. So thank you so much for joining me and I hope that that felt good. That was amazing. <laughs> oh, there's thank your girl. You. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, so like you and I've seen some people saying it, the working in childcare can be very difficult. Yes. when you're home and so i promised my wife at five o'clock i would take kenzie so kenzie say hi to everybody they can see you hi oh she's so cute <laughs> yeah 20 months uh so dr Alvarez, thank you so much those are very beautiful words there to share at the end so uh, yeah if, if anyone has um any questions um just let me know or send them my way and i just want everyone to know also that um i own this meditation studio called quell it's q w e l l and chris i'll give you the website but uh, we're offering virtual zoom meditations guided meditations every day so um and it, it's good for anyone around the world so we'd be happy to have you guys join us in our community there that's wonderful and then follow-up email we'll send that website and the instagram and everything else so they can stay in touch with you great, great. service you're providing so thank great. you okay thank you all right so that just about wraps up our our pcs in the time of coronavirus webinar so thank you all all of you who joined there's still hundreds here so thank you so much we wish you the best going into the weekend um i want to again thank professional yeah. Life foundation canada and the ontario ministry of heritage sport and tourism culture lisa mcleod len asper and the gang at anthem 
please stay in touch. You know, this is a long game for all of us. So use the website, sign up for social media, sign up for the newsletter, stay in touch. And then I love all the chatter. Keep sending us ideas of other ways we can serve you uh, during these difficult times. Um, you know, it's just good just to get together with so many people who care. So I love all the notes. You guys are the best. Um, have a happy and healthy weekend during this uh, very difficult pandemic. But remember, this is not forever. Things will get better. So bye. Have a great weekend. And I'm going to go play with Kenzie. Awesome. Bye, guys. Okay, bye-bye.